Oliver Onions was a British novelist and short story writer best known for his short story collection Widdershins. Born in 1873 in Bradford, son of bank cashier George Frederick Onions and of Emily Alice Fearnley, he studied at the Royal College of Art for three years while also developing his interests in motoring and boxing. Initially, Onions worked as a commercial artist before turning to fiction. His debut work was his 1900 The Complete Bachelor, a humorous story of a 40-something bachelor having to deal with the matchmaking efforts of his friends and relatives published in the final year of Victorian England. In 1909, he married Amy Roberta Ruck, a writer herself, having penned more than 90 romance novels, including such titles as Kaki and Kisses or Sherry and Ghosts. His Widdershins, containing his much reprinted The Beckoning Fair One, came out in 1911. In 1918, he legally changed his name to George Oliver, he died in 1961 at Aberystwyth. Onions wrote both regional fiction set in Yorkshire, a trilogy of thriller novels collectively titled Whom God Had Sundered, beginning with his 1912 In Accordance with the Evidence, but he is best known for his ghost stories. Today we will be examining his somewhat less famous, though still very interesting, the Hand of Cornelius Voigt from 1939. The story begins with Peter Biles, a young boy of 12, being taken away on holiday with his sister Nora and their sobbing nanny to ensure they wouldn't bear witness to their father's death. Once they are brought back to their hometown, the siblings are separated, with Peter being sent off to live with Herr Dr. Cornelius Voigt an old friend of his father's who often played chess with him. Upon arriving at the Herr Doctor's mansion, Peter is greeted, as it were, by Heinrich Opfer, a strict lecturer who is to teach Peter a method of non-verbal communication, as Dr. Voigt is both mute and deaf. At first, Heinrich is very distant from the boy, but there soon comes an understanding between them. However, Peter feels that Heinrich is trying to keep him from playing chess for some reason related to the doctor. He finds a series of black and white tiles and uses these to play games in secret, the discovery of which duplicity greatly distresses Heinrich. Later on, Heinrich admits that the doctor intended to have Peter only taught sign language, but be deprived school, not be brought up to university or to go into a business, in short, to be taught nothing of any practical sort by design. Heinrich then reveals that Peter only had the idea to invite the perpetually secluded doctor to Peter's birthday party, from the same reason that Heinrich suddenly collapsed when trying to stop him due to a sharp pain in the knee, these all being the products of the doctor's domineering will. Eventually, Peter is forced by the doctor to demand Heinrich be sent away, and his own secluded life begins, with only the mute, towering form of the doctor and a servant or two for company. However, in time, the dominant presence of the Doctor somewhat mellows out and no longer casts such a dark shadow over the dismal house. Growing up and deciding to be rebellious, sneaking out to see the films he would not be allowed to otherwise, he notes the city is beset by a workers' riot and only with the help of a notorious rebel leader on the run does Peter manage to stop an angry mob from storming the house of the now bedridden, decrepit old doctor due to his family's hold on Voigt, Sons and Successors, a local town business whose workers are very much moved to revolt by recent events. The end of the novel shows the doctor in a more human light, seeing him suffer from dementia, needing to be cared for by the youth. While the ending is not bad, one finds that the earlier half of the novel is much more effective because Voigt's knowing things he can't know and seeing things he can't see 
makes his a much more tantalizing presence, barely seen but felt at every corner. It is still a good novel, though it didn't quite live up to expectations.